what I suggest is why don't we just take two or three minutes just to do whatever we need to do, suggest some sort of movement, just to kind of allow ourselves to kind of uh, move back or come. Uh, so this is uh, continuing uh, looking at the wheel of life and uh, wanting to uh, well look a bit more at this, um, what we describe as the six realms. So this was, um, we started to look at this uh, in some detail last week. Um, and this week, my suggestion is that, or what I'm kind of curious about exploring is, what is it that can start to slow the wheel? How can we start to really face the delusions, the binds that we get into that uh, bind us to the wheel. And uh, one of the things is that my sense is that many of us come into the Dharma or meet the Dharma because we're imagining that somewhere else there is a better life, that we are trying to reach for a better life somewhere in the future. So how would it be to posit the uh, idea that maybe all that we need is right here and now? Can we really be this revolution here and now? Dare we place our faith in finding the power of a skillful, compassionate response simply by trusting this capacity to live in awareness and to see this living in awareness as the primary act of revolution. I'm saying this particularly in relation to the six realms, because I think one of the aspects, one of the kind of keys to the realms is that inherently in those realms, we are getting lost in some uh, deluded way of seeing, knowing uh, our own capacity for love and how we're going to get that met. So we're kind of held in these sort of tyrannies of, of expecting that we can adjust, make the world fit somehow our fantasy of if we can get that right, then we will uh, be loved, we will be lovable, uh, and uh, receive that which we long for. And I think this is one of the tyrannies of uh, the spiritual life, of Buddhism, of any religion, is that it can often be picked up as the means to suggest that who or what we are right now is somehow lacking, that we're not good enough. In some way, we're flawed. And so we need this path to make ourselves different, to make ourselves right. And this language of development and personal growth, all these things lead us into a sense of willfulness, trying to push ourselves forward into an imagined life. And that pushing forward, leaving our actual precious unexpressed potential of this life here and now remains just that, because we're reaching out into the future into growth, into development, we kind of become ungrounded in our unlived potential. So how has that come to be? How have we learned to deny what we are and try to become someone who is not us? What drives us to lift up out of our life out of ourselves. 
And this is one particular question I think that invites us, or the wheel invites us to kind of reflect on, to turn over in our mind. Because one of the things that we have so strongly illustrated in this image is that the wheel is spinning above the earth. This spinning above the actual world. So in this image, where is our backside on the earth? Where is that immediate contact with our natural home that we're abandoning? Why are we abandoning that for this sphere of delusion? So it's a question I have and uh, been wondering about. And reading around it, some might suggest that this drive, this drive to lift ourselves out, out of our actuality, is part of an adaptive patterning that we try to take on to survive, to be accepted, to be loved, to not be banished for who we are. What this suggests is that we take on the shapes that we need to, to survive in the hope of receiving the love that we all long for from ourselves or from others. So this is where we find ourselves on the wheel, in the wheel. That to survive, we've had to create strategies to allow ourselves or to move in a direction where we think we will be met by love for ourselves and from others. This is the, the power that drives the wheel. So what I hope is obvious about the spiritual life, our human life, is that it is inherently relational. So it's not something that we can do in isolation. The fantasy of a spiritual life in isolation is just that, a fantasy, a willed fantasy. But we'll always be turned back, invited back into our actual lived experience of ourself and each other. As soon as we begin to meet ourselves through the heart, as soon as we begin to attempt to meet each other through this doorway, this precious doorway of the heart. So uh, just taking us through a guided reflection, which was trying to evoke this layered nature of the heart. So just to be clear, the heart is not our physical heart. It's really an image or a way of talking about love. And this word love, it's got a whole range of complex connotations to it. So maybe it's better to use the Buddhist term or the Buddhist language of metta or metta. And one of the key qualities of metta is that it's not dependent or expectant of any particular response. So we don't have to be a particular way to receive or express love. And it's for this reason that metta is synonymous with awareness. Awareness always simply meets experience as it is. Meta as awareness is always without judgment. It always brings clarity and luminosity to our experience. Just that when we turn towards an experience, as if the experience brightens. And I use this image of the, the dark sun, which I personally find very helpful. Just it's almost as if that 
bodily darkness gets lit from within and illuminates our experience, the sensations. So awareness simply meets our experience as it is, without judgment, clarity, and with luminosity. And it requires no generation. Meta is not something that we have to create. Makes it so important to do this practice of the meta bhavna, the development of. But it's not to bring it into being, it's more to bring our sensitivity to something which is always present, which is always here. Which I hope having that perspective can bring a real relief to us. It's not something we have to squeeze out of ourselves, squeeze out of our heart into the world. It's simply we open to the world without judgment, open to that which is always here in awareness. So the heart is really an image for this emergent potential of metta that arises as we bring awareness to the meeting, the meeting point between self and other, between these apparent worlds. So it's something like a doorway or a hearth where we meet. And in that meeting, the work really is to attune ourselves to the quality of the heart, to notice that the heart is a mediator and an instrument through which we can meet. So the more capacity we have to live from the heart, that helps us to define at least uh, colors our capacity to either give rise to further suffering or to relax towards liberation. At its most basic level, we could say our heart is either open or closed. <coughs> so we're utterly interwoven with each other. And yet we are also utterly unique. We are a unique singular expression of love within this whole field of precious humanity, of precious life. And one of the uh, primary tasks of this life is to know and bring choice to the capacity of our mind, our body and heart, to actually begin to either free us or we can choose for that same heart to bind us through delusion and mistaken views. This is the wheel of life. The heart, the deluded heart that looks outside of itself, that looks in distorted ways to have it's being acknowledged. So the wheel is said to be like a mirror, but it invites us into this territory of self-knowledge, of self-understanding, and opens a door to freedom. It opens to freedom because this image, as we mentioned last week, it's infused with the signs of the grace of the Buddhas that bathe us, that ease the heart open towards insight. So each of these particular realms, as we looked at last week, has a particular Buddha quality that is meeting that specific quality of heart to help the heart release, to help it open towards insight. So it shows that both the karmic fruits of our willed actions, our body, speech and mind, 
and the gift of being in awareness is always available to us. And the heart is a natural territory where we can begin to explore and release our self-created bindings, which lock us into the wheel. So I'm just going to very quickly say a small thing, a few things about this experience of the three layers of the heart. Just try to bring it down a bit. So uh, the last couple of weeks, I found myself unexpectedly in quite high levels of distress, hurt and despair. So I've been forced to test and rely on these three levels of what I and others are referring to as the heart. So the heart has been tested in the last two weeks or so for me. So the front heart, as I'm describing it, is where the activated memories of responses of body and mind swell into being here and now. And these activated memories, these historic ways of being, feel so real. And yet when the conditions fade, those experiences also fade back into the ground of experience. So this front heart to me feels like the surface of an ocean. It's waves, it's ripples and energy is ever changing. It can become activated in a moment, like a gust of breeze on a still day, or it can build like a wind that threatens to uproot our very being. So this is the conditioned heart. The front heart is the conditioned heart of karma and conditionality. And for me, what it takes me to is an historic echo of aloneness that came out of daring to ask for what I needed and coming away empty handed. So even though I could see and know the unintended responses, they conjured into being something into, into my being out of ancient seeds, these karmic seeds within my psyche. And I felt powerless to stand against. I felt in, uh, enchanted by these uh, states that had arisen in me. So I felt completely powerless within this enactment uh, of aloneness. But fortunately, the heart runs deeper than the surface waves. So as I've said, below and behind and around the front heart is this deeper heart whose rhythm and flow seems ancient, a darkness lit from within a space without edge, but definitely still here in this body mind. And it's this core of the heart which we protect through our attempts to adapt, to keep the heart safe and living within us. This deeper heart is by nature vulnerable. When I open to that deeper sense of my own heart, I open into vulnerability. It's also open, it's responsive, it's spontaneous and empathic. So it can hold and hear and soothe the front hurt, the front heart that is meeting the world. So leaning back into that deeper resource space even though there's vulnerability there, it can hold this more reactive, more historic layer of heart. So this deeper layer created space and a holding 
for my historic child lying alone in the darkness. So the deeper heart could help this boy speak and name the pain and in the naming be heard and held in that awareness. So when we get lost in the ancient stories, the invitation is to reach for that deeper space of awareness so that this wheel is slowed, the reenactment is slowed, and that we can recognize that the center is still protecting the most precious aspect of our being. This capacity to love and be loved is still alive within us. And behind this deeper heart is the heart that holds, that contains, that is boundless, the heart of awareness itself. And for me, it's awareness that is always guiding us back into this actuality, this precious life. So I was wondering, why do we struggle so much with the heart? Why do we express this will to live that smothers our simple being? Why do we force ourselves into shapes that distort our being? Why do we look out into the world to act out our struggles? And why are all these realms ever manifesting the avoidance of our tender heart? So one suggestion that I find true, it rings true for me, is that I find it very difficult. In fact, I find it un unable to face my own wish to die. So I might have to unpack that a bit. So how does that arise? It rises, this wish to die is because I cannot survive the pain of unmet longings for love. So the child cries until it is exhausted and falls into sleep. So we collapse de depleted and that feeling of collapse of utter depletion is so dangerous. The despair is so deep, we have to choose to die. Now maybe not metaphor, uh, not literally, hopefully, Just put that in, but not literally, but we do die to ourselves. We disappear to ourselves. We find ways to not feel the pain of unmet needs. We metaphorically die because our own unmet needs feel too huge to bear. Our love is unreachable and our aloneness is too much to bear. And so we seek the oblivion of death, of forgetfulness, the strong sensations that mask the real. We wish to die because the heart is too sore to bear. And so the wheel is created. As I lift out of myself, I no longer feel the truth of my actual experience. I lift out of the pain of my actual experience. I lift up and out into craving, into pride, into anger, into delusion, into addiction and attachment, so that I don't have to feel this wish to die. And here we are turning towards being, being the revolution, is to face below that wish to die is the precious unlived life, which we all long to express. This potential that we all have when we let go of that need to be different, to reach beyond ourselves, to lose touch with the earth, 
when we let go of that, when we meet this unmet pain that leads us towards death. This is where we stand in our Buddhist practice. So we have, uh, well, we don't have to, we choose to use the wheel of life, to look into this mirror and to call on each other for support. We call on the Buddhas for support. The wheel of life is held up by an apparent monster, and yet it is the greatest gift that offers to lead us back into the heart, guarded by the acting out, guarded by the fantasies of growth and development and the dark wishes to die. Within it all sits the potential of our life, waiting patiently to be lived. This is the mirror of the wheel of life. I think we'll have a cup of tea, shall we? <laughs> <laughs>